Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 16th of May. Um, actually, quite a lot of updates this week, so let's kind of get to it. But as always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment, and share really is appreciated. New videos this week. So I created a video really just answering the question. Why do most things in Azure deploy to a region? Um, why doesn't it magically just distribute to multiple regions? How do I make my AKS cluster spread over regions on my app service plan? So in this video, I already walk through the why, why you don't really want it to, and how we make services go across multiple regions as easily as possible. And then there's a brand new feature. I talked about it in last week's update, the new attribute-based access control for Blob. So I did a deep dive with lots of demos showing that. So new features. So on the compute side, now when we create a virtual machine, we can actually enable the Azure Site Recovery just as one of the steps as part of that process. In the Management tab, when we create our VM, I can now say, hey, enable disaster recovery, and that will start from within that guest OS, start actually replicating to storage in that region that I select. So super easy to get up and running now. Azure Static Web Apps have gone GA. So these are a new type of solution. When I have modern applications that have a static front end that maybe calls some serverless API, I can think about I have a pre-built, a pre-rendered front end. Maybe I'm using Angular or Blazor or Vue or there's a ton of other solutions. But I'm not using server-side processing for that front end. It's just predefined content that then goes and talks to some serverless backend like Azure Functions. So Azure Static Web Apps enable me to host those and they're actually globally distributed. They hook into my Git repository, be it Azure DevOps or GitHub, so that if I make a kind of a new commit or I accept a pull request, it will automatically go and get the changes and just surface, and again, it's globally distributed. It's not just in a region. It also gives you a free SSL cert. I can have a custom domain. There's both a free and actual paid for version of the Azure Static Web Apps. It automatically integrates with Azure Functions. It has different authentication providers uh, like Azure AD. I think it's GitHub and Twitter. And there's just, again, all these massive number of front end supported. There's a VS Code extension to all for them. So if you have this scenario where I do have this generated, this pre-rendered, pre-built front end, hey, this is now a great way to host that. And again, you get a free SSL cert even on the free plans. So go and give that a go. That's now GA. On the networking side, so Azure App Gateway now has mutual authentication. So we're used to the idea that as a client, if I go and talk to a server, it validates who it is. There's a public certificate, I go to its DNS name, and I make sure it really is who it says it is through that public private key. Well, with mutual auth, what I can actually do to App Gateway, I upload a single file, but it has the entire certificate kind of chain from the root all the way up through any intermediaries for the leaf certificate that might be used for the client. So now App Gateway will actually validate the client's certificate that it presents to it. Um, so, so we can now get that mutual authentication. This is very useful for like IoT scenarios where we now have lots of these devices. I want to make sure they are who they say they are. And for the back end servers behind App Gateway, it can still pass on details of that client certificate. It uses variables. So for example, there's a client underscore certificate it will populate that with the details um, of that client cert. There's a bunch of other variables as well. But this is now in public preview if I need that mutual authentication through App Gateway. And then Azure Bastion VNet peering support is now GA. So Azure Bastion is all about the idea, hey, I want to connect to my virtual machines, Windows or Linux, but I don't want to expose public ports to the internet. So Azure Bastion is a managed service that I say, hey, I want to connect to my VM through that Bastion service. When it used to be, I had to define it per virtual network. Now it supports peering. So if I have VMs sitting in a peered virtual network, 
I can still use the Bastion in my primary virtual network, but go and connect to VMs in peered networks. So instead of having to have multiple Azure Bastions that cost me money, I can now have an Azure Bastion in maybe my hub network, but I can now go and connect to virtual machines through that Bastion service in any of those spoke, those peered networks. So that is now GA. On the storage side, so UltraDisk has lower pricing. Remember, UltraDisk has those independent dials. So ordinarily with disks, we pay kind of a capacity and the throughput and the IOPS go up linearly. With UltraDisk, remember, what we have is, sure, I set a capacity, but I can independently change the IOPS and the throughput. I pay for what I need. And I can dynamically change the IOPS and the throughput at different times. Maybe I have a, a peak load at a certain time. I could increase the IOPS and the throughput and then reduce them back down all while the disk is running. So what they've essentially done is they have reduced the cost of that throughput. So if we go and look, and it's about a 65% reduction. So if we scroll all the way to the bottom and look at UltraDisk, we can see once you essentially get to one terabyte over here, I can go all the way up to 160,000 IOPS and two gigabytes almost per second. And what they have done is notice you pay independently for the capacity, for the IOPS, and for the throughput. So it is that throughput number that is now about a 65% reduction. So that helps it be more competitive, opens it up to more scenarios where we can actually now use that. ZRS managed disks are now in public preview. So remember the whole point about um, ZRS is within any given kind of region, the point is it's actually made up of different physical facilities that have independent power, calling and communications. So in the past, the managed disk was LRS. There's always three copies of the data that makes up that disk, but they were in one of those facilities. Well, now I can create a managed disk, and that managed disk is essentially has its three copies of data distributed over three availability zones. So that's better resiliency now. Now, my VM, so I can have a VM over here connected to the disk. If that AZ now failed, well, now I can actually go and create a VM in here and connect to it. I could even have an idea if I set this up as a shared managed disk, I can now have VMs in different AZs connected to the same disk. And then of course, if this one fails, hey, it can fail over it's that SCSI persistent reservation. So this ZRS option for the managed disk opens up a lot of new scenarios. Now it is limited right now. It's like West Europe, North Europe, West US two and France central, but it's preview, you can go and try that out but now I can actually have that scenario. Uh, Azure NetApp Files AZAC Snap has gone GA. So remember Azure NetApp Files is the first party Azure service, but it's using NetApp filers, the NetApp storage solutions in Azure data centers. And it can give me kind of these very high performance options, uh, NFS, SMB, et cetera. If I have an SAP HANA workload running inside a virtual machine, what this lets me do is I can run the AZ AZ snap by the cron job, either inside that VM, or it could be on anything that has a network connection to it. It will get the database in a backup consistent state. So app consistent, it will talk to the Azure NetApp files to do a snapshot, and then it will release the application so it can carry on going back to its regular workflow. So it does that complete orchestration for me to get app consistent backups on my Azure NetApp files. And today, again, that's for the SAP HANA in SUSE and RHEL environments. Postgres, SQL, Flexible and Hyperscale have PG Bouncer in public preview. So if I think about for these databases, I can have a certain number of connections to them and then it maxes out and I can't get new connections. 
PG Bouncer, this is a managed offering. What happens now is when I enable the PG Bouncer for my server group, I get a new connection string. So now if I connect to PG Bouncer, it then does a connection to either the flexible or the hyperscale Postgres offering. There's still a finite number of connections, but it will kind of queue them up and connect as it can. So it basically lets me have more connections at once to that PG Bouncer, who will then actually control the connection to the actual database. And then MySQL now has a MySQL flexible offering has a PowerShell module. This is in public preview. It's the az.mysql. It lets me kind of do the complete provisioning, the management, all from PowerShell. Miscellaneous. So Azure AD actually has two features. The first is this PowerShell exporter module. So you can actually go and get this from GitHub. I've got the link in the description. And what this basically, as the name suggests, is from PowerShell, I can now go through after I install this, and it works with regular Azure AD and B2C, and I can select what I want to dump out. So I can dump out the configuration, I could dump out my user objects, my groups as a list of all the different types of objects it actually supports over here. And it's gonna dump that out to a JSON file. I could then put that in something like, for example, a version control, whatever I need, as a way to kind of track my state and actually track what's changed over those things. So this new exporter, useful to go and get that information out to JSON from my Azure AD or Azure AD B2C. And then they announced a bunch of new conditional access features, some are GA, uh, some are in preview. So if we go and look at this, this is all about kind of the RSA conference. And what we can see is, if we just go to the detail, so now named locations. And what we can now is we can have more of them kind of actually through just regular, have number it actually supports, maybe that was further up. Um, but also it, it supports now, there we go, there's the more of them and IPv6 based. But it can also now hook into GPS. So it can actually prompt your device to say, hey, they wanna kind of check your location. And for these mobile devices, the location will now be based on the GPS within the device. So if I go over to security, look at my conditional access, look at name locations, and I'm gonna actually go and, let's do add a country location. Notice I have this option in preview, determine location by GPS coordinates. So now it will ensure you're actually based on there, not just based on IP address, but actually based on the GPS co coordinates given to it by your mobile device. And as it talks about, you will kind of get this prompt to say, hey, uh, it wants to track your device, is this okay? There are various filters now when I'm actually looking at items within the kind of conditions, for example. I'm gonna get the ability to now filter exactly what I can see. I've got better audit logs as I change policies. I'm gonna now get details about exactly what changed. I have the ability to kind of copy the JSON if I wanna revert back to an older version of it. Again, it talks about the scale changes for those named locations from 90 to 195, I can do IPv6 address ranges, a whole bunch of new things. Better filters around all my different policies. So if I jumped over, I can add filters and that kind of add some new things around that. And then the Azure AD login, so this lets me actually log into a VM. If it's Windows, that now is GA. So it will just automatically hook in through my Azure AD and let me authenticate. And there's a preview update, so it's really changing the way that's working for Linux to a new solution. Uh, so that's kind of an update there as well. So some really nice things talked about there actually for Azure AD. For Azure Sentinel, if you're using Azure Sentinel and Teams, they've added this virtual war room. So hey, an incident has happened, and I quickly need to collaborate with a bunch of people. Well now, from threat management, I'll be able to actually say, hey, I wanna open up a team. And it will bring the people in together. 
it will create tabs for the incident, files about the incident, anything that's pertinent, and now you're working from Teams on that particular incident that was kind of all the data is actually in Sentinel. So this ability to have these nice virtual war rooms. Talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. So Windows Virtual Desktop, well, we pay for when a VM is running. So for personal, i.e. this VM is used by this user, they added the ability to start on connect. So when I try and connect to what is dedicated to me, it would start it. Now they've added that functionality as well for pooled. So pooled is, hey, there's just a group of VMs. And if I'm using multi-session, now once all of the session limits are hit for all of the running VMs, it will go and start up a new VM. So again, it's all about optimizing my cost by only having things running when I really actually need them. And that's it. Um, so quite a few updates, some really nice things there, again, in the description below. Uh, I've got the links to the, the key things that I talked about here. Next week's Azure update is going to be a little bit different in format because I'm going to be in Tulsa sitting in a hotel room because it's Iron Man Tulsa next weekend and it looks like it's happening. So when you're watching this next week, I'll actually be doing the Iron Man. So I'll, I still want to bring you the latest updates, but I'm going to be doing it from a hotel room. But hopefully I can still uh, do a pretty good job. So until next week, everyone take care.